Hello, and welcome back to the Formal Review. Today, we'll be having a very special episode. Now sit back, maybe grab a drink, and let's talk about this movie. What's up, everybody, and welcome back to the Formal Review. This is Season 3, Episode 52, and I thank you all for tuning in once again. This is the February History episode. So this episode is the 12th episode in the monthly Look Back at History series. Each of these episodes, I, along with a special guest, look back at a very important moment in history. We usually will discuss everything that surrounds the importance of that event, along with the film that is connected to that story. It may be the creation of a comic book character, or it may be a significant moment in a war, or perhaps something completely different. Listeners will never know when in the month that this episode will drop, the topic, the film, or who will be joining me. The only way to find out is to follow me on social media to see when the newest episode is about to be released or subscribe to your favorite podcast platform. So in this episode, we will be covering a very important movie, not only to society, but to me as well, as it is one of my favorite movies of all time. On February 21st, 1965, at the Ottoman Ballroom in Manhattan, three men rushed toward Malcolm X and killed him. And because this man is a very important person in U.S. history and civil rights movement, I thought it would be a very good idea to talk about this movie and also the man himself. So obviously, we will be talking about the 1992 Spike Lee movie, Malcolm X, along with our favorite Spike Lee movies and also our favorite Stenzel Washington movies. So stay tuned. Have you ever thought about starting your own podcast? When I was trying to get this podcast off the ground, I had a lot of questions like, how do I record an episode? How do I get my show into all the apps that people like to listen on? How do I make money from my podcast? The answer to every single one of those questions is really simple. Anchor. Anchor is a one-stop shop for recording, hosting, and distributing my podcast. And best of all, it's absolutely 100% free and ridiculously easy to use. And now Anchor can match you with some great sponsors that means you can get paid to podcast right away. In fact, that's exactly what I'm doing right now. So if you've always wanted to start a podcast and make money doing it, go to anchor.fm forward slash start to join me and the diverse community of podcasters already already using anchor again that's anchor.fm forward slash start and i can't wait to hear your podcast Now, before I introduce my guest, I do want to say that there are some spoilers here, obviously, because this movie came out in 1992. So if you do care about that, I would definitely recommend going to watch the movie, then come back and hear our conversation. But if you don't care about that, keep listening. So I would like to welcome on my very special guest, Reverend Eric Dobson. Thanks for doing this. I do appreciate it. Why don't you introduce yourself, give the people background, what do you do and why did you choose to do that? Sure. I'm the deputy director director at Fairshire Housing Center, which is a public interest law firm in New Jersey that works to enforce New Jersey's fair housing laws that came out of a historical zoning case in New Jersey back in the late 70s and early 80s. So I got involved with Fairshire Housing Center about 12 years ago. Prior to that, uh, I had my own business working on uh, issues of social justice, racial and economic and social integration. Been to uh, several years early as a pastor in, in the city of Philadelphia and, and in New Jersey and left the pulpit to work on public policy. So that's what um, my interest is. When it comes to, because you said you like you work with like racial issues and stuff. So was it something that sparked the interest when you were younger? What made you go into that? Yeah, I, I grew up in a very politically active family in Philadelphia. So coming out of, you know, getting involved in, in the church world and the clergy world. So I was one of those very politically motivated, community focused clergymen. And that led me, you know, doing a lot of work in Philadelphia, feeding the homeless every Sunday for eight years, working with this small nonprofit called Caring About Sharing, getting involved in some of the juvenile justice concerns in in the city, uh, youth being tried as adults. So that got me really focusing on how this justice system and all all systems in in America definitely was something that needed work to mitigate the structural racism that exists. And so that's 
kind of sort of like the path that I took and it went down that road. Yeah. So Malcolm X, who was born Malcolm Little on May 19, 1925, was an African-American Muslim minister and a human rights activist who was a very popular figure during the civil rights movement. He's obviously also known for being a very vocal spokesman for the nation of Islam. So here's a quick history lesson. Malcolm X grew up in a lot of different foster homes or with relatives after his father's death or in his words murder and his mother's hospitalization and engaged in very many illicit activities and eventually was sentenced to 10 years in prison for larceny and breaking and entering. Then while in prison he joined the Nation of Islam and adopted the name Malcolm X to symbolize his unknown African ancestral surname and he obviously became one of the most known persons of the nation of Islam and honestly one of the most influential leaders where he very much advocated for black empowerment, black supremacy, and separation of black and white Americans and really did publicly criticize the mainstream civil rights movement and its emphasis on nonviolence and racial integration. Then in the 1960s, Malcolm X started to become disillusioned with the nation of Islam because of some controversy with Elijah Muhammad and embraced more of Sunni Islam and the civil rights movement after completing his Hajj to Mecca, which for those who don't know, this is the pilgrimage that Muslims have to make at least once in their life. And he then became known as El Hajj Malik El Shabazz. So if there was one word that you could use to describe Malcolm X, what it, would it be? Um, one word, uh, inspirational. Why would you say he's so inspirational? What is his impact, his legacy and meaning to you as a person? I, I think one of the things that what he meant to me was just giving a sense of pride of being an African-American, being black, which as a kid growing up, unless you grew up in an environment where your family was, you know, part of the, the civil rights movement, which mine was per se in some ways. But when you learn or when you do self-knowledge around this issue yourself, you really find out how instrumental he was during that time. And there were different, many different black movements on that time and how he was just phenomenal, um, phenomenal leader. Yeah. Do you have a favorite quote or, I guess, moment? Um, of course, by any means necessary is, is one of the big ones. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but I can tell you a moment in history for me, and I think the, what changed the direction for me as an individual was his speech, The Ballad of the Bullet. 22 million black victims of Americanism are waking up, and they're gaining a new political consciousness. You're, you're in a position to determine who go to the White House and who stay in the doghouse. You're the one who has that power. You can keep Johnson in Washington, D.C., or you can send him back to his Texas cotton patch. You're the one who sent Kennedy to Washington. You're the one who put the present Democratic administration in Washington, D.C. The whites were evenly divided. It was the fact that you threw 80% of your votes behind the Democrats that put the Democrats in the White House. When you see this, you can see that the Negro vote is the key factor. And despite the fact that you are in a position to, de to be the determining factor, what do you get out of it? The Democrats have been in Washington, D.C. only because of the Negro vote. They've been down there four years. And there, all other legislation they wanted to bring up, they brought it up and gotten it out of the way, and now they bring up you. And now they bring up you. You put them first and they put you last. The party that you bass controls two-thirds of the House of Representatives and the Senate, and still they can't keep their promise to you. Anytime you throw your weight behind a political party that controls two-thirds of the government, and that party can't keep the promise that it made to you during election time, and you are dumb enough to walk around continuing to identify yourself with that party, you're not only a chump, but you're a traitor to your race. That really shaped my whole desire to learn more about Malcolm. The Ballad of the Bullet was speech that outlined the political climate of uh, the country at that time and many you know African Americans at that time had switched from the Republican Party to the Democratic Party and Malcolm was laying out what the black leaders at that time meeting with these Democratic officials and he was saying a vote for Democrat is just a vote for Dixiecrat and the Dixiecrats of course was the southern white supremacist of the south who had mm -hmm. switched from the Republican Party to the Democratic Party so he was just laying out don't be fooled by the trickery of politics and political parties because they're one and the same right. powerful speech it, it, it's a you got 
to check it out. It's amazing. Yeah. It's, I mean, there's a lot that I have that I've really like gained, I guess, uh, a familiarity with and like that I've liked. Like you said, the by any means necessary, obviously one of his most famous ones. But my personal favorite is the same old slave master today has Negroes who are nothing but modern Uncle Toms, 20th century Uncle Toms, to keep you and me in check. Keep us under control. Keep us passive and peaceful and nonviolent. It's like when you go to the dentist and the man is going to take your tooth. You're going to fight him when he starts pulling. So they squirt some stuff in your jaw called Novocaine to make you think they're not doing anything to you. So you sit there and because you got all that Novocaine in your jaw, you suffer peacefully. The white man do the same thing to you in the street. When he gonna want to put knots on your head and take advantage of you and don't have to be afraid of you fighting back, to keep you from fighting back, he get these old religious Uncle Toms to teach you and me that just like Novocaine, suffer peacefully. Don't stop suffering, just suffer peacefully. As Reverend Cleek pointed out, let your blood flow in the streets. This is a shame. Because nothing in our book The Quran teaches us to suffer peacefully. Our religion teaches us to be intelligent, be peaceful, be courteous, obey the law, respect everyone. But if someone puts his hand on you, send them to the cemetery. That's something that personally that I tie myself to. Be able to defend yourself when you can, but don't go out looking for it. So that's uh, one of my favorites. But I guess because you kind of touched on it, you mentioned like your family kind of involved with the civil rights movement. I guess what do you remember about being your first? Oh, Malcolm is like you said, you were talking about that one speech. But was there like one that like when you were a young kid or no, it no happened, it was, but- it, actually, it was a moment in history where I had to reexamine Malcolm because I grew up in a Christian home and growing up to be in a Christian pastor. And at that mm-hmm. time, you know, my theology wasn't definitely not what it is today. I mean, you know, during that time, you know, Christians and Muslims or, or the black Muslims at the time was two totally separate movements. And so, you know, I hadn't studied Malcolm that much because of those reasons. And so the one time I really got into them, we were having, you know, very early on to start doing black history and someone said, well, we should do Malcolm X. They wanted me to play Malcolm X. And <laughs> I had to read the autobiography of Malcolm. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah, I was like, oh, sh-. <laughs> like I, I learned a lot very early, late teen years, 20s. Yeah, I knew about him, but I actually read the book and was just blown away. And that's when I started. Mm-hmm. My brother happened to have audio tapes at that time. I don't know. I don't know if folks know what audio tapes were, cassette tapes. I don't know. If they yeah. know what, yeah. <laughs> so my brother had had all these speeches of Malcolm X and books. And so I just jumped right into full fledged into Malcolm. I was like late teens, early 20s was uh, my intro introduction to really getting to know him. Yeah, uh, I didn't have the exact same experience, but my thing was, it's actually the movie that we're talking about. That was like my first, I guess, introduction to him. A friend of mine recommended it to me back in high school and I fell in love with the movie. And then I read the autobiography and which I'll get into a little bit, but that's the short story of it. But is there something that you think is misunderstood or unknown about Malcolm because he's still, I think, marketed by some people as an extremist. And while he did have some of those views, he obviously changed throughout his life. But is there like anything else that maybe you think is misunderstood or unknown? Yeah, you know, I think all of us to an extent are, are misunderstood, right? So I think obviously Malcolm, there was his detractors because of some of his early uh, messages around not including white people to support. What can a white person like myself who isn't prejudiced, what can I do to help you and, and further your cause? Nothing. You know, and obviously that changed. And I think that piece was misunderstood, just not knowing the context where he was coming from. You know, when you have a black separatist group, like at the time, Nation of Islam was, those were the views of of a group that was trying to survive in a world where white supremacy was ruling the day, right? Right. So there is some, I think Malcolm's cousin or something wrote a book called The Seventh Child, where he goes into the point that Elijah Muhammad and the Nation of Islam actually met 
with the KKK are and agreed to have separate spaces. So it's, it's a great book that goes into some discussion about that. I haven't read the book in years, but I think that's one of the things that surprised Malcolm that Elijah Muhammad had met with them. So you had an extreme view, white supremacist view of that time, and you had a black view that was like, you know, let's combat that with say, oh, we're separate. So I think that part of Malcolm early years was misunderstood because he was dealing with a white supremacist country at that mm-hmm. time, but really used violence in order to inflict upon black people. So mm-hmm. what other choice did you have outside if you didn't go with Martin, then it was either Malcolm or the Black Panthers and all of them was dealing with violent or well, violent white supremacist groups. Mm-hmm. That's really interesting. I, I did not know that about the KKK meeting. That's really interesting. One of the things uh, on a slightly less serious note, um, and I think it's kind of always a cool aspect, is Malcolm's love for photography. I always think that that's a kind of just a little cool tidbit that not a lot of people really know very much. And that's another movie that I think they approach that with, the One Night in Miami movie. It's a Rolleiflex 3.5, a German twin lens reflex camera. It's a fine piece of engineering, gents. You see, it has this uh, pop-out viewfinder. Man, it looks bulky. No, Jimmy, it's a work of art. Besides, uh, you know, I always got my Nikon handy for taking photos on the move. And I really like that they did that because, yeah, like you said, Malcolm, like, is, I think, very misunderstood a lot of the times because of how extreme he was. But given everything that he had to deal with up to that point, you can't really, I guess, blame him for that. Obviously, he comes around after going to Mecca and everything and obviously, like, leaving the Nation of Islam. But I think that's really, honestly, for me, is what makes his story just so sad, but also such a good story in itself. And I actually was learning also a little bit because I just finished watching the docuseries on Netflix, Who Killed Malcolm X? And it's quite interesting because the Manhattan District Attorney was going to potentially reopen the case after this docuseries being released. Have you watched that at all? I haven't seen that, no. It's just like this one guy who is Muslim and he's kind of just investigating everything. And it's just, I think, maybe eight or nine episodes, I think. And it's just really interesting of learning the more obvious of how much the the FBI was even involved with that. I mean, I knew that the FBI was involved just because of Hoover was obviously very racist. Like, yeah. yeah, yeah, that's a way to put it too. But it was really interesting because there's like one part where they go, the FBI knew Nation of Islam didn't like Malcolm and they didn't like Malcolm. So they just kind of like let the assassination happen because a very loose way of putting it is the enemy of my enemy is my friend. They recognized that there was this hostility and that Malcolm was more likely than not going to be killed and they just kind of like let it happen because it just knocks off another black leader that the FBI doesn't have to do. Yeah, I haven't seen it, but I know know reading about, you know, I have the book FBI Files on Malcolm X and I I think the FBI played an active role in it. Not that they just let it happen, but I think they were actually, you know, played an active role in it. Um, I mean, I'm always learning new things so <laughs> so to wrap this up is there any other but I guess because you alluded to it growing up in a like a Christian household because this is one of the differences is how especially during civil rights movements of Malcolm X versus Martin Luther King and how there's obviously the religious difference but then also just the philosophical differences of how to approach the civil rights movement so when you were growing up was there any like anti Malcolm sentiment or indifferent sentiment and then like, you say like you, it's kind of changed over time but your thoughts on like the difference of those two men specifically or difference between you having Malcolm or anything like that there was no anti Malcolm sentiment it just you know it wasn't to my late teens so you know I really got to understand him so it wasn't an anti Malcolm sentiment it's just that you know growing up in a Christian house I was just more focused on you know Dr. King and some others but you know towards Dr. King's towards the end of his life that you can see there was a definitely a shift from some of his um, you know more radical believe uh, he, he, there was a sense of urgency in his life because he knew and I kind of sort of felt like both of them knew their lives were eventually head towards the same end. I think I recall some reading somewhere where both of them had indicated one time they'll doubt if they lived to see 40. Um, yeah. So I, Dr. King really, really had a sense of urgency once he came, actually came north and really start seeing what was it like in the north in Chicago in the slums and, you know, his whole shift towards the economic peace integration and just like Malcolm, his speech against the war of Vietnam really set his death mark. It became clear to me that the war was doing far more than devastating the hopes of the poor at home. 
It was sending their sons and their brothers and their husbands to fight and to die in extraordinarily high proportions relative to the rest of the population. We were taking the black young men who had been crippled by our society and sending them 8,000 miles away to guarantee liberties in Southeast Asia, which they had not found in Southwest Georgia and East Holland. So we have been repeatedly faced with the cruel irony of watching Negro and white boys on TV screens as they kill and die together for a nation that has been unable to seat them together in the same school. So we watched them in brutal solidarity, burning the huts of a poor village. But we realized that they would hardly live on the same block in Chicago. I could not be silent in the face of such cruel manipulation of the poor. As I have walked among the desperate, rejected, and angry young men, I have told them that Molotov cocktails and rifles would not solve their problems. I have tried to offer them my deepest compassion while maintaining my conviction that social change comes most meaningfully through nonviolent action. But they ask, and rightly so, what about Vietnam? They ask if our own nation wasn't using massive doses of violence to solve its problems, to bring about the changes it wanted. Their questions hit home. And I knew that I could never again raise my voice against the violence of the oppressed in the ghettos without having first spoken clearly to the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today, my own government. For the sake of those boys, for the sake of the hundreds of thousands trembling under our violence, I cannot be silent. That was it. You know, that was, mm -hmm. you know, Malcolm's was, you know, leaving the nation of Islam and speaking out against things that were going on there. And Martin speaking out against the war of Vietnam, I think that sealed his fate. Yeah, it was always interesting to me, like how a lot of people, obviously, like when you think of Martin Luther King, of how obviously the I have a dream speech, the mountaintop speech. But then, like you said, like a lot of the time, especially toward the end, he not so much got more, at least to my understanding, not more radical in the sense of going all the way to where Malcolm was initially, but he definitely understood more, I guess, of the not always a nonviolent practice. And I mean, that goes into kind of what was going on, obviously, last summer. And not to get into that too much, but... You know, he did say... It is as necessary for me to be as vigorous in condemning the conditions which cause persons to feel that they must ga engage in riotous activities as it is for me to condemn riots. I think America must see that riots do not develop out of thin air. Certain conditions continue to exist in our society, which must be condemned as vigorously as we condemn riots. In the final analysis, a riot is the language of the unheard. What is it that America has failed to hear? That large segment of white society are more concerned about tranquility and the status quo than about justice, equality, and humanity. And so in a real sense, our nation's summers of riots are caused by our nation's winters of delay. And as long as America postpones justice, we stand in the position of having these recurrences of violence and riots over and over again. Right. What you know was clearly aware of what, why these acts of expression, as he would call it, expression of the voices, and he didn't condone it. He, well, he didn't say it was it was wrong either. <laughs> Not that you know, what I mean, yeah. I, I, he he understood it. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, and I think that's one of the things that what's really interesting about like another Spike Lee movie kind of touches on when it comes to just top Spike Lee movies. Spike Lee as a director. He obviously talks about, one, the racial divide, but then also putting people of color just in the front end and telling their stories but, and do the right thing. Obviously, when Mookie, after all of the entire like things that he's going through and throwing the trash can into the window and it sparks a riot. But there's been this entire essential day where he's dealing with a lot of systematic racism that existed. And so, I mean, that's one of the reasons why I really like that movie. And that's one of, I think, Spike Lee's best film. But this one that we're talking about, 
about today is my number two, I would say. And then I think Black Klansmen last year or two years ago are his three best films, in my opinion. What about you? Well, obviously, Do the Right Thing is an all time, probably one of the best movies ever made. It's, it's a classic. You know, it deals with gentrification, it deals with race, it deals right. with, you know, all those issues, interracial relationships, the complex issues of gentrification. <laughs> uh, it's just a brilliant movie. And obviously, Malcolm X School Days is another mm-hmm. Spike Lee film that's a classic. You know, just growing up watching School Days and She Gotta Have It is another. I don't know too many movies Spike Lee haven't made that weren't good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And one thing that Spike Lee does is, um, and I like rewatch these movies the past like few weeks, and it's really interesting to see how he uses a lot of the same actors again and again. And when I rewatched it, I forgot that Giancarlo Esposito was in these movies. When I watched Malcolm X most recently, he's one of the assassins to kill Malcolm at the end. I completely forgot that. And I mean, there's the more obvious ones. Like he uses Denzel Washington a lot, but he's one of the bigger ones, whereas Giancarlo is a little bit more low key. And it was kind of cool to rewatch that. But obviously with the star of Denzel, what would you say your favorite Denzel movies are? My gosh, Denzel is just like, I mean, he, he just have a litany of them. Like, you know, Malcolm X, Fences. Oh my God. That yeah, that's really good. Now, don't you go through life worrying about whether somebody like you or not. You best be making sure they're doing right by you. You understand what I'm saying? Yes, then get the hell out of my face and get on down to that A and B. That the acting in that was just brilliant. I mean, just so many with Denzel. Remember the Titans? You smiling? Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Why are you smiling? Because I love football. Football's fun. Fun, sir. Fun, sir. It's fun. Yes. You sure? I think. So. Now you're thinking. First you smile, then you think. You think football is still fun? Uh, yes. Sir? Yes, no. No? Sir, sir uh, well, it was fun. Not anymore, though, is it? Is uh, it? No, not by now. No, it's not fun anymore. Not even a little bit. Uh, no. Make up your mind. No, no. Think, since you're thinking, now go on, think. No, is no. it fun? No, sir. No. No, sir. Absolutely not? Zero fun, sir. All right, listen up. I'm Coach Boone. I'm going to tell you all about how much fun you're going to have this season. You know, everybody say Training Day, but that, you know, it's a, yeah, it's a great movie, but some of the, his... <laughs> King Kong ain't got on me! Ironically, I can't not watch every time the Equalizer come on. I'm going to find myself glued to it. It's like, what? Tell me you did it to this badge. Disrespected this badge. You understand me? Yeah. That's a good one, too. Way too many to the list. I mean, he just got way That's too many. That's very true. Yeah, I, I agree. Like, it's hard to pick, like, just a select few of them. Because, like you said, like, in addition to those, I, I really like also American Gangster. Blue Magic. That's a brand name. Like Pepsi. That's a brand name. I stand behind it. I guarantee it. They know that, even if they don't know me any more than they know the, the, the chairman of General Mills. One of my favorite, I think, gangster movies ever made. So it's, like you said, it's hard to pick, like, just really good because he does really good in almost every role. Even if the movie itself is not the greatest, he can still do a really good job. Everything he's in, when he played the pilot, oh, what's the name of that movie? Flight? Yes. This is Southjet 227. We're in an uncontrolled dive. Descending out of 21,000 feet. We're declaring an emergency. We dumped our fuel. We got a jam stabilizer or something. That was great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, that's good another. Too. Yeah. <laughs> So now onto the movie at hand. This movie tells the story of the activist Malcolm X that was also co-written by Spike Lee. It obviously stars Denzel Washington and also Angela Bassett, Albert Hall, Al Freeman Jr. and Delroy Rindo and also Lee himself and also has cameos by the Black Panther Party co-founder Bobby Seale, Reverend Al Sharpton and also the future South African President Nelson Mandela. And the film dramatizes a lot of key events in his life which we'll get into in a little bit but it basically covers pretty much every aspect of it and this screenplay was credited mostly due to alec haley's 1965 book the autobiography of malcolm x which haley collaborated with malcolm x beginning in 1963 and it was completed after his death then in 1968 there was a screenplay written from the novelist james baldwin but it took a really long time to develop and then there was just a lot of production issues that went 
many, many years. This was because of the controversy that Malcolm X had with his denunciations of whites before he took his Hajj, and a lot of people did not really want this to be made. But eventually, Warner Brothers agreed to make this movie, and they originally wanted the Academy Award-winning Canadian director Norman Jewison to direct, who also directed this civil rights film In the Heat of the Night. And then he was able to also bring Denzel Washington on to play the title character. Now, there was a huge protest about this movie because Jewison is white, and Spike Lee himself was one of the many voices of this criticism, and a lot of people including him, felt that it was only appropriate that a black person should direct this movie. And after this outcome, Jewison actually left the project, though he said that it was not because of the protest, but because he could not put a story together. And later on, Lee confirmed that if Jewison could have done it, he would have fought Lee to keep this script. Lee was then named the director of it, and he made a lot of different changes to the movie. And even though Washington had agreed to play Malcolm prior to Lee's joining, Lee said he he never wanted anyone else to play him because they had worked together and also that Washington had played Malcolm before on an off-Broadway production. And what's really interesting is that this is not the first film ever to be done with a portrayal of Malcolm X. Actually, Morgan Freeman played Malcolm X in Death of a Prophet, which is a 1981 television film. Now, Lee's version of Malcolm X kept on going through production. There was also a really hard time for Lee to get a budget for this because Lee told Warner Brothers that he needed a budget of over $30 million. And frankly, the studio just disagreed and didn't really want to give him that money. And he eventually, Lee took advice from Francis Ford Coppola and basically took the movie so far into production that essentially forced the studio to increase the budget, which was initially budgeted to be $28 million and then climbed to $33 million, two of which was actually from Lee's own $3 million salary. And they told him that he could not make the film more than two hours and 15 minutes, which actually shut down production on the film. Then, a lot of prominent black Americans did give their money to allow this movie to be made, such as Oprah Winfrey, Michael Jordan, Magic Johnson, Janet Jackson, and Prince. These are the people that basically wanted this movie to be made in the way that Spike Lee wanted to, and he wanted it to be over three hours long. And when he was filming it, he actually did get Malcolm X's real-life wife, Dr. Betty Shabazz, as a consultant. And there was a lot of really interesting things about this movie that had to be done, such as this is the first ever non-documentary and also first American film that was given permission to film in Mecca, and they had to hire an entire new crew to film this movie inside the city because non-Muslims are not allowed in. And this just goes to show how much Spike Lee really wanted to make this movie. So, what do you like about the film? You know, classic Spike Lee, you know, his, his movies just have the cinematography, the way he uses characters, the way he shoots stuff is just brilliant, you know. And the movie itself, getting the full story of Maka Max, you know, from his childhood and his struggles. I think it was great to you see where Malcolm really got his Pan-Africanism from you know, knowing black nationalism you know Marcus Gar his father was part of the Marcus Garvey movement and it had an influence on him and it never left him uh, ironically that tells a great story about how that all evolved yeah I agree I think that's one of the when it comes to biopics this is one of those that it's like on a pedestal for me and then it, I compare any biopic to that because this like you said you see him from a child all the way up to obviously his assassination and I think that like you said the parallels between him and his father and especially when they throw the Maltovs into his house and it starts burning and he has to like save his entire family it's exactly what his father did at the beginning against the Klansmen. And it's interesting, especially given, obviously, the history behind Malcolm's assassination. It's almost the opposite side of things because of how the Nation of Islam, the people who you would think would be on his side toward a lot of these things, weren't. But they were just as, I guess, destructive in that specific avenue as what the KKK was doing to his father. And it was just 
a really interesting aspect that I actually didn't think about until this most recent rewatch for me. But like you said, yeah, I think the cinematography is really, really great. And I think what's really good about any Spike Lee movie is that I think they usually will always meet the test of time. And the messages that they're trying to say, like, I mean, it's unfortunate, but they're still applicable to today. Like, this movie was made in 92. That was that long ago? My goodness. Yeah. And it's the same thing with Do the Right Thing. Like, that movie is 89, and you can apply so many of the messages to today's world, even though, like, in the grand scheme of things, obviously, a lot of things have gotten better, but we're not where we need to be when it comes to a lot of different things. So that's one thing in general, like, what I love about Spike Lee movies, but everything from the storytelling and just the acting, obviously, by pretty much every one in this movie is pretty fantastic and I mean for me this is one of my favorite movies of all time so it's hard for me to say anything that I dislike about it the only thing I would maybe say is that it's a long movie I think it's like almost three and a half hours it's worth it in my opinion but is there anything that you would say you don't like about it no I I wouldn't say there's nothing I don't like about it but I would say that when you think about Malcolm and the stress and the pain that he was dealing with nowadays and I guess the, if it was back in 1992 if he if Spike did it over again I probably would show more of what Betty Shabazz was dealing with too like mm-hmm. she was dealing with the same stressors you know yeah we think about Dr. King we think about Malcolm you know we, we talk about their wives but you know the agony and the struggle and the stress that they had to be dealing with was just as much as what the two men were dealing with as well yeah that's very true I think that something and in another movie with Judas and the Black Messiah. Have you seen, oh, have you yeah, seen that just, yet? Yes, yes. Yeah, right that's, yeah, that's something that they address. They show Deborah Johnson struggles, which was very different from, like you said, what Spike Lee was doing. You see the stress of the women on it. And they have a completely different point of view, and a lot of the earlier films don't show that. But it's good that that's now happening. So when this film was originally released, it grossed over $9 million in its opening week weekend and in total the film grossed over 73 million dollars and Denzel Washington's portrayal of Malcolm X was extremely praised and he was even nominated for the Academy Award for Best Actor but he lost Al Pacino that year for Scent to the Woman and Lee even said himself that he's not the only one that thinks that Denzel was robbed on that one and I agree with him on that. Then on Rotten Tomatoes it has an 89% based on 61 critic reviews and a 91% based on over 50,000 audience reviews with the critics consensus reading quote anchored by a powerful performance from Denzel Washington Spike Lee's biopic of the legendary civil rights leader brings his autobiography to life with an epic sweep and nuanced message then on Metacritic the film holds a weighted average score of 72 out of 100 based on 9 critics which indicates generally favorable reviews then in 2010 it was selected into preservation into the United States National Film Registry by the Library of Congress as being, quote, culturally, historically, or aesthetically significant. And obviously, like, we've already kind of talked about the film holding up. So to wrap this up, are there any other final thoughts that you have that you want to say about the movie or Malcolm X as a whole? Yeah, you know, they they always reinvent the characters and Malcolm was always being misunderstood because the, you know, the established society didn't like him at the at time so it's encumbered upon people who really want to get to know Malcolm is to really dive into his story and read his autobiography and learn a little about his life because mm-hmm. you'll see a man who like all of us evolve over time right we mm-hmm. you know our views about certain things don't stay the same if you're always learning and growing your views evolve and I think that's mm-hmm. the same thing if you ever wanted to get to know Malcolm you had to know him in totality and why at that time why separatism he thought was the best thing you know you coming mm-hmm. from that society in that era yeah president lincoln told frederick Douglass, you'll never have equality in this country you're better off going to another country mm-hmm. so these are the things when I mean, you're looking at in totality of the man's life or any person's life you have to see the evolution process and i think unfortunately he or martin didn't live long enough for fred hampton died was killed at 21 right to really see the fruits of what was possible in this country and it's just sad you know to quote doc rivers <laughs> now in the philadelphia 76ers coach who was a clipper 
coach when the, the whole uprising last mm-hmm. summer. It's a shame that black people keep loving this country and get love back. And, right. and Baldwin put it best, I think, is saying the folks who really believe in this country and fight for the Constitution is black people. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and when you think about it, the concept around civil rights is a concept for civil rights for all folks. And we're just, you know, the black community is just fighting for the rights to be an American citizen of the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment. Equal protection right. under the law. And those fights have never just been about African-Americans. It's always been about for all citizens. You know, mm-hmm. it's never been just black rights. When you help those who are oppressed, you help the entire society. So, mm-hmm. and I, I think that's what's misunderstood about Malcolm and all the civil rights leaders who are fighting for uh, racial justice, because racial justice only improves the lives of all Americans and not just those who are oppressed. Yeah, I agree. So if this is your first time tuning in, what I always do with a guest is have a set of questions. And this is based on the TV show Inside of the Actor Studios. Lipton took his inspiration from the French book talk show host Bernard Pivot, who had a similar question there at the end of every episode on his show of apostrophes. However, it was not invented by Pivot. It was invented by Marcel Proust. I was a big fan of Lipton's Inside the Actor Studio, so to keep his memory alive, I thought I'd have a list similar to his at the end of each episode whenever I have a guest on. Now, I'm not going to keep the exact question here that James Lipton has done. I'm just like he did not keep the exact same questions that Pivot did, but I do want everyone to see where my guest heads at when it comes to movies. So this will be a little bit of fun. So let's get started. Coronavirus aside, how often would you go to the theater to watch movies? <laughs> I'm my wife and kill me because I don't go to the theater that much. I love movies, but I don't like going to the theater. (laughs) How often would you say you watch movies at home? Again, coronavirus aside. Yeah, all the time. Is there an actor or director that will make you want to automatically, all right, I'm definitely watching this. Yeah, Spike Lee is one. Mm -hmm. You know, Denzel, you know, anything Denzel comes out. Samuel Jackson's, you know, underrated. Regina King, just brilliant. Do you prefer digital or hard copy movies? Uh, Digital. What movie-related profession would you like to attempt if you could? Oh, that's a hard question. I guess director? Okay. What would you say your favorite movie is, or if you can't pick one, movie genre? Yeah. Boy, I, I definitely can't pick one. But I love like these type movies. But it's comedy. I love comedy too. I can't wait to uh, coming to America too comes out. Yeah, I can't wait for that either. <laughs> That's another really great movie. What is your least favorite movie or movie genre? Horror. Best Batman actor. Ooh, wow. <sighs> Ooh, that's a tough one. I, you know, I thought Ben Affleck did good, but you know, Michael Keaton. Eh, but uh, why am I forgetting the actor's name? Short guy. Um, Christian the, Bale. Yes. Yes. Okay. Is it biopic or biopic? Biopic is what I usually say. Okay. There are people out there who use both of them, so I'm always curious. And then, if heaven exists, what would you like to hear said to you when you arrive at the pearly gates? Oh, boy. That's a strange question because uh, I don't think heaven exists in the terms of how we think about it or we were taught to think about it because I think heaven exists here within us. So I, I think I would like to hear that you really embrace who you really are as a person. That's heaven. And with that, we have now concluded our interview. So why don't you tell people where they can find you if they want to reach out to you? You know, I work at Fairshire Housing Center, so if folks want to reach out to me, they can reach out to me there. Thank you very much for coming on. I appreciate it. I always love having like guests and stuff and talking to somebody who may know more than I about something. I really thank you for coming on and talking to me. No, no problem. Take care. All right. Bye-bye. Now, what did you think of the movie? Let me know. Hit me up on social media. The former review is on Facebook, Twitter, the Graham and now YouTube, where I will be posting many things, including trailer reaction. Handle is all the same. It's at the formal review. Feel free to also check out backseatdirectors.com, where I work with a big team to put out movie reviews and also editorials. Again, that's backseatdirectors.com. Please also subscribe to the formal review. We're on Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify. We're now on Amazon Music, iHeartRadio. Honestly, pretty much anywhere you can find a podcast 
we have our content there. Also, I'm always wanting to grow and improve, so please leave a review and what you want to hear because I really do this for you all. I see the numbers and I really appreciate everyone supporting me and talking to me about movies because frankly, that's what it's all about. And for anyone who has supported me on a financial basis, thank you again. And if you want to help support on a financial basis, please go to anchor.fm forward slash the minus sign formal minus sign review and click support this podcast and honestly any donation is appreciated thank you all again for tuning in and until next time wear your mask wash your hands stay safe and take care everyone thanks for tuning in to another episode of the formal review cheers and we'll see you next time